And this is BBC One. Good evening, and back to our evolving universe. Last month, we set the scene. We discussed the early days of the universe, dark matter, the expansion of the universe, and what we call the microwave background. Very weak radiation coming in all the time from space, and possibly the remnant of the Big Bang when the universe was created roughly 13,000 million years ago. And there are two more definitions. One is the Hubble constant. And this defines the rate at which the universe is expanding, galaxies flying apart. And secondly, what we call omega, the amount of material in the universe. Is there enough material to draw the galaxies back, or will expansion go on forever? That's what we want to find out. And so far, we seem to be almost balanced between the two, and that's very odd. Chris, welcome back. Pleasure. Uh, but it does seem very strange, doesn't it? Why should the universe be balanced like that? And if so, how can we account for it? It is a problem, and one of the first arguments to be advanced was based on what's known as the anthropic principle. Simply put, it's the idea that the universe had to be this way or we wouldn't be here to observe it. In other words, what Fred Hoyle once said, if it wasn't so, then we wouldn't be here, we'd be somewhere else. Exactly, or in different, w in different words, if omega was different from one, intelligent life would never have evolved. And this is obviously true for values of omega far from the critical. So, for example, if omega was 6 billion, huge amount of mass in the universe, the universe would have collapsed sec seconds after the Big Bang, there would have been no time for stars or planets to form, and we certainly wouldn't be here. On the other hand, if omega was incredibly small to fraction of a fraction of one, then it's clear that the universe would have expanded so far and so fast that stars and galaxies would never have condensed together, and again, we wouldn't be here. Where the argument falls down is nearer the critical value, Surely it can't be that crucial for life if omega turns out to be 0.999992, for example. A much more convincing, much more elegant, beautiful argument is based on what's known as the inflationary theory. This is like a change to the standard Big Bang theory that's now accepted, I think, by most cosmologists. No, no. And the idea is this. Within the first few fractions of a second after the Big Bang, the universe suddenly underwent a period of much more rapid expansion than we see today, before slowing to the sedate pace we observe today. But how did that solve the problem? Well, it allows us to have a much larger universe. Um, remember, faster expansion over the same period of time allows us to have a larger universe, and that forces the critical value towards omega equals 1. Difficult to understand, but it's rather like us here standing on the surface of the Earth. If I stood on this globe, I'd certainly be aware it wasn't round, but standing here in the studio, it's difficult to tell that the Earth, which is much larger, is actually curved. In a similar way, if we look at this triangle on the floor of the studio, the floor appears flat, the angles in the triangle appear to add up to 180 degrees, even though they're on the surface of the Earth, a globe. Whereas on our small globe here, the line with the Greenwich Meridian makes 90 degrees with the equator, That's, this makes 90 degrees, the line going through New York, and this angle isn't zero. So we end up with a triangle with more than 180 degrees in it. Different geometry, but locally, when we look just on the floor of the studio, observations th show that the Earth is flat. There's another point to be made too. Last month, when we talked about the microwave background, we said that it was uniform all over the sky. Well, that's nearly true, but not quite. And there is one very important complication. What we didn't say is that the reason it's uniform across the sky is it's reached thermal equilibrium. The heat has basically spread out right around the entire universe. But under the standard Big Bang theory, there hasn't been time for light to travel from one side of the observable universe to the other. There hasn't been time for light to travel there hasn't been time for heat to travel because nothing can travel faster than light. So there hasn't been time for it to even out into this nice, even distribution that we see today. So the inflationary theory solves this by allowing us to have a much smaller universe at the beginning, before the rapid expansion that makes inflation. And at that point, all the light and heat can travel around, can spread out at that point, before the expansion, getting us out of our problem. And so that's the start of play at the start of the 1990s. All the theoretical ideas that theorists thought would be used to understand the universe were coming together. Um, the problems in the Big Bang theory had been solved by inflation. And observational results, such as those from COBE of the microwave background we saw last month, were just coming together. And it was then that two teams of astronomers, working separately, 
came up with one of the most unexpected and incredible results in all of modern physics. What they were trying to do was measure the deceleration of the universe due to the influence of gravity um, using a new type of standard candle, supernovae. Now, a supernova is a most colossal outburst involving the death of a star. There are various types, but all are immensely powerful. At its peak, a supernova may shine as brightly as all the other stars in that galaxy put together. And therefore, they can be seen over vast distances. Uh, they're rare in our galaxy. The last one occurred in the year 1604, but of course they can be seen in other galaxies. And it's very important to catch them early. And both amateurs and professionals are involved here. For many years, it had been known that the, a certain kind of common supernovae, known as Type 1A, reached a standard brightness and could be used as a standard candle in the same way that we did with the, that Hubble did with the Cepheids that we talked about last month. Once we know what brightness something is and we know how bright it appears to us in the sky, we can work out the, use the difference to work out the distance to it. That's what we call a standard candle. Now in a Type 1A supernovae, what we have is a white dwarf star, that's the core of an extinct star, orbiting a normal main sequence star like the Sun. It, the intense gravitational field from the dense white dwarf pulls material off the normal star, which forms into a disk around the white dwarf, carries on building up until a critical mass is reached, and then nuclear fusion can ignite. Now, the critical mass is the same regardless of the system, so there's always the same amount of material burning. So we always have the same brightness, and that's what we see as a supernovae. They're incredibly powerful and can be detected across millions of light years. And that means, of course, that we're looking millions of light years back in time, millions of years back in time. And from that, we can, we can detect the deceleration of the universe. One problem, of course, is to observe these very distant supernovae, you need large telescopes. And telescope time is always at a premium. And therefore, the astronomer had to apply for telescope time well in advance and just hope that a supernova would be obliging enough to appear. It didn't always happen. That's right, and with odds of like, hundreds to one, people, the project managers were reluctant to give precious telescope time to a project that had little su chance of succeeding. The problem was that supernova searches used to cover only a few galaxies a night, and the odds of there being a supernova in one galaxy at any particular time are extremely low. What the two teams of researchers realized was that they could use electronic methods to automatically search for m many more galaxies for supernovae. They can now look at hundreds or even thousands of galaxies in a single night, greatly increasing the chance of detecting a supernova in any one of them. So they can go to the project managers and say they can produce supernovae, or they can discover supernovae on demand, which they can then study with the large telescopes, which gives us the depth and the range further back into the universe that we need. And one amazing result. By studying these supernovae, possibly at the distances, and therefore the speeds of recession, and both teams found something totally unexpected. They expected the uh, universe, the acceleration to slow down. It's not, it's speeding up, and that was a complete surprise. To put that into perspective, you have to realize that everything in the universe, everything we observe in, the, in space, everything astronomers observe, and everything we observe down here on the ground, can be explained by physicists in terms of just four fundamental forces. Gravity is a good example, and that's the only one that we knew acted over large distances. But of course, that's, a that's an attractive force. It pulls things together. So to produce an acceleration, we need a fifth fundamental force that we had no clue about until these results came in, something that can push apart over huge distances. And yet, in fact, Einstein had seen this problem long ago, and to solve it, he introduced an entirely new term, which he called the cosmological constant. He included it in his general theory of relativity, which he published over 80 years ago. He realized that his theory predicted that the universe should collapse under the influence of gravity. And he, knew, he thought he knew that that wasn't happening. So he introduced the classic fudge factor, something I'd be shouted at if I did in my work. He introduced the classic fudge factor that was an anti-gravity force that kept the universe together. Of course, when Hubble's results came out a few years later, he realized that he, his theories predicted that the universe had to be expanding or contracting. He could have predicted the expansion of the universe. He called it his greatest blunder, and he removed the cosmological constant from his theories, and it was quietly forgotten about for nearly 80, or 80 years. I met Einstein once, long, long ago, and of course, he could make mistakes. And he may have said his cosmological constant was a great blunder, but now it seems it may not have been a mistake after all. It's true that most astronomers, or many astronomers, now think that we need to incorporate it into our theories. All we can really say at the minute, though, is that the results are self-consistent. They agree with 
each other, and both groups seem to be finding the same sort of effect. Whether that's actually due to effects with the supernovae remains to be seen. For example, it was thought initially that the effect might be due to du dust between us and mm. the supernovae, artificially, if you like, dimming yeah, yeah. the light from the, start from the supernovae. But both teams are now observing in both red and blue light, and most dust effects we know of would selectively affect one end of the spectrum rather than the other. Most seem to, for example, dim red light more than blue, but we see the supernova effects right across the spectrum. So that's, that explanation certainly has fallen by the wayside. We've got to remember that our knowledge of supernovae is by no means complete. And rather sadly, there hasn't been one in our galaxy for nearly 400 years now. I mean, we'd all like a nice, bright supernova close to us, but I think not too close. But in 1987, we had the next best thing, a supernova in the large clouds of Magellan, 169,000 light years away. And that became easily visible with the naked eye, although too far south was seen from here. And that one gave us plenty of surprises. It's certainly true we don't understand all the effects that are at work. For example, if you remember that all the heavy elements in the universe have been produced in stars that have already lived and died, you'll realize that way back at the beginning, where we're looking with these supernovae, your f the he composition of the stars is different, and we're not sure how that will affect what we see. Maybe it will affect the maximum brightness and change the rules, and that could account for the observations. However, as we keep pushing the observations further and further back in space and in time, then a simple test will become possible. At the beginning, you have a much smaller universe, and gravity is much more powerful. Things are closer together, gravity is stronger, and so it becomes much more important. And in fact, there will come a point at which gravity, as we look further back, becomes more important than the cosmological constant force. And this has become known as the flip over. Take this graph, for example. Each of the points are the supernova results. Redshift at the bottom is a measure of distance. So as we move from left to right, we're getting further away. Uh, the lines on each side of the points are the error bars, the measure of the uncertainty in the measurement. Now, if the results are actually to do with the expansion of the universe, what we'd expect is something like this red dotted line. Most of the points lie on it, but you can see over on the right-hand side of the graph, it dips down again. That's where gravity becomes important. That's where we we're observing a deceleration of the, of the universe. Now, if it's a systematic effect, if it's anything like the heavy elements, then, of course, as we get further back, you'll get fewer and fewer heavy elements. The effect will carry on increasing. You'll get something like the yellow line. It increases even as we get past what should be the flip-over region. So the evidence isn't there yet. We don't have the data from that far back, but we're getting pretty close. And in the next few years, we should be able to tell which of those lines the data lies on, which of those futures our universe has, what explains the results. We do need more research. But you know, Chris, I think it's fair to say that by now, the results coming in from different lines of research are giving us a fairly consistent picture of the universe. It's an incredible time to be studying cosmology because we have lots of different experiments in lots of different fields that seem to actually agree with each other. Take, for example, this graph. On the bottom axis, we've got plotted the amount of matter in the universe. Remember, omega equals 1 is the critical value. And on the left-hand side, we've got plotted the value of the cosmological constant. So until just a few years ago, we would have thought that everything lay along that line with the cosmological constant equals 0. Now, the blue region on the graph, that, that oval shape, is from the results from Maxima and Boomerang, the balloon experiments into the microwave background we talked about last month. Now, the reason it's an oval is because we're not absolutely certain of the results. So that's like a probable region. The universe almost certainly lies somewhere in there. Similarly, we've got the ovals on the left there, which are from the results we've just been talking about, the supernova results. And you'll see they cross. It's not quite the two perfect straight lines that cross that scientists expect. It's more like colliding zeppelins. But there is a region somewhere in the center there where both sets of results agree. And that's where our, we think our universe will be found. So what does a universe inhabiting this region of the graph look like? Well, the first thing to say is that it's still flat, even though we don't have the critical density of matter. It turns out that what we need to consider is not the critical density of just the matter in the universe, but the critical density of the energy. Of course, Einstein was the first to realize these two were equivalent with his famous equation, e equals mc squared. So using this information, we can draw together like an energy budget for the universe. And it turns out that all the luminous matter we can see all that astronomers have been studying for all this time. Everything you see when you go out and look up at the night sky counts for only 10% of the energy in the universe. So where's the other 90%? Well, 
20% of it's in the dark matter we talked about last, last month and we've mentioned already that today. That 20%, we know it's there from indirect observations and things like weighing galaxies, but we don't know what it is. There are many candidates, but we don't have a clue. And the 70% that's left, that's involved in what's known as dark energy, the energy that powers this strange fifth force, the cosmological constant. And up until a few years ago, we had absolutely no idea that that was there. We had no idea that 70% of the universe existed. I have a feeling, you know, that this dark energy may hold a key. Well, Chris, we've been doing this now for two programs. Let's try and sum it up as concisely as you can. Difficult to do, but it's certainly true that we live in an expanding universe, that there's nothing special about our position in it. It would appear the same from whichever galaxy we happen to be in at the time. We know that the universe underwent an extremely rapid expansion within the first few fractions of a second, the inflationary period, before slowing down again. And we think, we just think now, that there's a fifth fundamental force that acts against gravity over large distances. And we, if that is true, it's true that most of the energy in the universe goes into that force. But, you know, a hundred years ago, we had no idea even that there were galaxies beyond our own. But it seems to be we're getting closer and closer towards a clear picture. What we'll be saying in a hundred years' time, I don't know. And there's one other point, you know. We talk about the Big Bang 13,000 million years ago. What happened before that? Well, if time, space, and matter came into existence at the same time, there was no before. There was no before. Time hadn't started. And uh, I wonder, can that be put into plain English? Well, I can't. Even Einstein couldn't. And I know because I asked him. And I wonder, Chris, are we ever going to solve these fundamentals? So far, the stronger details, but fundamentals, no. I'm sure we'll learn a great deal more, as you say, a hundred years' time. But whether we're on the right track, I don't know. I think we are. Time will tell. Chris, thank you very much. A pleasure. Uh, if you want our website, www bbc.co.uk stroke space or cfax page 620 and this newsletter time therefore if you want your newsletter send your stamped addressed envelope to newsletter number 83 the sky at night bbc tv london w12 7ts when i come back next month we're talking about something very different we are leaving galaxies leaving theory leaving evolving universes and coming right back to our own part of the universe, the solar system. I'll be joined by Dr. John Mason, and we'll talk about the Leonid meteors, or shooting stars, tiny particles that burn away as they dash into the Earth's air. And uh, every November, we have a shower coming from the constellation Leo, and it can be spectacular. It may be a disappointment, I don't know. Anyway, we'll talk about it, and we may, just may, have a really good display of cosmic fireworks in the middle of next month. So until then, good night.